that, uh, that are existing here. I just want to say first, uh, I, I said hello yesterday here on the stage. Uh, I'm brand new to all of this. I uh, started, did an NFT launch in, in November, and it's been this whirlwind of three months of, of craziness. And I have to say, uh, I, I heard it even about this conference on Monday, and my partner at Ample had encouraged me to come. And the first night alone, it was immediately obvious. The, uh, it was immediately obvious the the energy and the excitement of folks who are eager to create and also um, redefine some of the, you know, some of the normal things that, we'll, that, that, that we're used to today into a better future. Um, so I'm representing Ample. We are a, uh, we are a Web3 company focusing on licensing and ownership for uh, independent films and music. And uh, I think one of the things that, that that I've been most inspired by the, watching the activity in the past year has been this um, this increase in activity from creators. And I know so much has been focused on on visual arts, and there are there are a lot of projects that are focused on music. I feel that they're just like the uh, there's a growing extension, and we'll eventually get to films. We want to be able to solve some of the problems that uh, that independent filmmakers have today with financing. I'm sure all of you know music festival. I'm sorry, uh, film festivals. Is, uh, often exists not only to kind of show the works, but also get and bring together investors and film financers and filmmakers, and we want to kind of solve that. You can read more about the platform, uh, and I'd be happy to, to chat more about what we're aiming to do, but this talk is not about that. Uh, this talk is about this book, and I just want to get a raise of hand if anyone has, has seen or read or, or is familiar with this book, A Pattern Language. I'm getting a, an ooh. Anybody else? Like, great. Uh, and I also wanted to break up the format as well. So this book, as far as I understand it, because it is extremely dense, uh, was published in the 70s in Berkeley um, by Christopher Alexander uh, and, and many others. I would encourage you to, uh, to, to check it out on, uh, on probably an audio book, I think, was, would be the easiest way to consume it because it is very, very dense. But it is essentially a collection of patterns, components, and uh, and learnings from observing, you know, human behavior in cities and organizations and towns over the over the span of human history, and trying to look for patterns and trying to codify those patterns. Um, I first heard about this book uh, because it was it was told to me that when the organizers of um, both Burning Man and some of the early festivals in the 90s and other large, you know, 70,000, 80,000 uh, person festivals were happening. They were using this book as kind of a, a blueprint on how to develop these little week-long or two-week-long cities that would exist and exist in a way that, that, that encouraged, you know, the best of humanity. The book is also popular with uh, object-oriented programmers. It is a kind of a guide to organize you know, you, actual logic and some of the, the code structures. And what I'd like to do today is use this as a metaphor for DAOs. I think there are, and it will, you'll, you, I think my, my theory is, is that if we read through some of these passages with an, a lens towards growing communities and uh, initiating these kind of human interactions for a better society that we'll be able to kind of use this, hopefully in the future, uh, as, a kind of a, a starting point as we as we build out communities. So just to kick things off, <clears throat> sorry, let me, get my, let me read some of these passages. Let's see if we can get. Well, let me read first the introduction, and hopefully this will make sense, just so we understand exactly what, what context I'm talking about here. It is shown that towns and buildings will not be able to become alive unless they are made by all the people in the society, and unless these people share a common pattern language within to make these, these buildings, and unless the common pattern language is itself alive. You can use it to design a pattern for yourself, or for your family, or with the other people to design an office or a workspace. And you can use it to guide your actual process of construction. <clears throat> the patterns are ordered, and there are more or less 260 of them in here, more of four or five pages each. 
They're ordered in a, in, in a sequence, beginning with the very largest, all the way down to the actual uh, uh, decorations of a home. For example, you'll find that patterns, and then they go off to list some of this as, as a one uh, example of this. Patterns of accessible green, pattern number 60, is connected first to a certain larger pattern, subculture boundary, number 13. Identifiable neighborhood, number 14. Work community, number 41, and quiet backs. These appear on its first page, and it's also connected to a number of smaller patterns. No pattern is, is an isolated entity. Each pattern for these communities can exist in the world only to the extent that, is supposed, that it is supported by the other patterns and the larger patterns in which it is embedded. So I want to just give, uh, I just want to kick it off. There's, like I said, there's 260 of them, but I just want to do four or five. And like I said, use this as a metaphor for DAOs. Uh, I don't want to read it. I'd like to ask, uh, ask a volunteer to come up and read it. There's just two paragraphs. Every chapter or every pattern has a problem statement two or three pages giving background about that problem statement, and then a clear and concise um, you know, instructions on how to implement and how to fix that as a, as a problem that we have in society. And if you're starting to connect the dots, I'm hoping, to, I'm hoping you can see that this could, like I said, be a guidebook as we, tr as we start to build some of these communities. Um, so can I have a volunteer to read the very first pattern? The very first pattern is actually called Independent Regions. It's very short, so don't be timid, please. Yep. That'd be great. Yep, absolutely. So here is the problem and then the solution is, they're both in bold. Problem at the beginning and then the solution at the end. Yep. Metropolitan regions will not come to balance until each one is small and autonomous enough to be an independent sphere of culture. Great. I'll read the solution two pages later. And you'll see they all for follow this exact same format. Wherever possible, work toward the evolution of independent regions in the world, each with a population between 2 and 10 million, each with its own natural and geographic boundaries, each with its own economy, each one autonomous and self-governing, each with a seat in a world government without in the intervening power of larger states or countries. So this is the very first pattern. This is, uh, as, I, this, as I mentioned, was the very first pattern and was the largest, right, of, of the many that, that uh, of all the patterns that exist. And it gives this idea of this ambiguous number, eight to 10 million people. Um, that's obviously for a, a city at a physical location, but again, looking at this for, as a metaphor for DAOs, and the globe and the entire global community, what, can, what could we possibly per infer or what could be an inspiration for how we define the limits of a particular DAO? Um, the next one, Agricultural Valleys, this is four, number four. If anyone else would like to come up? Do have another volunteer? Again, uh, problem and then the solution. The land which is best for agriculture happens to be best for building too but it is limited and once destroyed, it cannot be regained for centuries. Preserve all agricultural valleys as farmland and protect this land from any development which would destroy or lock up the unique fertility of the soil. Perfect. Let me get the graphic up so you can see it. This is agricultural valleys, again, uh, preserve all agricultural valleys and farmlands to protect this land from any development which would destroy the unique fertility of the soil. Again, again, this, this talk was scheduled at 420, so, uh, so just humor me for a little bit if we dive into more theoretical things. But I want you to, again, put on the lens of the metaphor of a Tao. What could possibly be the interpretation of a valley which is perfect for crops in the hills which are better for living in residential and rest? Does anyone have any ideas or any thoughts? Something, he said, uh, something you monetize versus something you build a community around. That's exactly right. And I think one of the warnings that it says of this, the problem is that that fertile land is also wonderful to build on, but it's a one-time 
you, you messed up that land and you'll have centuries to, to wait until that land's uh, able to be used again. Again, a metaphor for DAOs. I just want you to think a little deeper in terms of, of what some of these meanings might mean. There's another one. Let me skip actually to Magic of the City. Pattern 10. Do I have a volunteer? Anyone running? Want, want to read? Yes. And if I wouldn't, if, if anyone else would like to read some of these subsequent patterns, if you want to come up. Here is the problem and then the solution. It's going to be right there in bold. Okay. There are few people who do not enjoy the magic of a great city, but urban sprawl takes it away from everyone except the few who are lucky enough or rich enough to live close to the largest centers. Put the magic of the city within reach of everyone in the metropolitan area. Do this by means of collective regional policies which restrict the growth of downtown areas so strongly that no one downtown can grow to serve more than 300,000 people. With this population base, the downtowns will be between two and nine miles apart. Perfect. Again, it gets, in, thank you. It gets into the specifics of uh, some of the quantities and some of the scale, um, but it's talking specifically about the magic of the city and the access and the ability to, for every community of that organization to access those rare points that actually have the most concentration of, 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 of significance. Um, let me throw the question back out to the, again to the audience. Again, this is talking about towns and cities, but with a metaphor of DAOs, anyone have any idea of what we're talking about when we say things like magic of the city and, and equality? Please, as loud as you possibly can. Great. He said uh, DAOs should be specialized and focus on one topic and instead of uh, trying to be all things and, uh, and all things for all people. Um, I'm actually gonna jump around again because there's another, uh, there is another pattern related to this that I think actually makes more sense. Let me flip it back. Do I have another volunteer? Anyone? Bueller, okay. Um, I'll read it, the problem and solution. This one is the Mosaic of subcultures. I loved this one. Let's get the graphic up here. Get that stuff away. All right. The homogenous and undifferentiated character of modern cities kills all variety of life styles and arrests the gross of individual character. Again, I just moved from New York City, so I find this offensive. However, he, they make a very good argument. Um, in, in saying that by not having the, uh, or by having the confusion of such a variety at all time, at all wakes of life, at every hour of the day, actually damages the soul instead of giving it the opportunity to concentrate on a very specific um, aspect of growth and, and, become, and, and become a strong person. The solution here, therefore, do everything possible to enrich the cultures and the cultures of the city by breaking the city as far as possible into a vast mosaic of small and different subcultures, each with its own spatial territory and each with the power to create its own distinct lifestyle. Make sure that the subcultures are small, small enough so that, they, so that each person has access to the full variety of lifestyles in the subculture near his own. Again, with a Dow lens, any idea of what that could possibly mean, and especially as we're dealing with things like Discord groups and, 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 uh, and Telegram um, group chats. Any ideas of subcultures and what that, what that could mean in, in the context of a DAO? Uh, the answer was uh, when there's too much happening in a Discord, um, and sometimes it's even when Discord goes down. 
Yeah, I think one of the, that's great. And when you do look at the, all the channels and you are getting all that noise, it's near impossible to, to solidify on a single idea and, and give it the, the air and the water that it actually needs for that idea to grow. Um, and let me just do a couple more and then share a little bit more about Ample. Uh, the next one about communities of 7,000. Again, this is kind of being very specific in terms of quantities, but I do want to get a little bit of idea of, of how this might relate to DAOs. The problem statement, individuals have no effective voice in a community of more than five to 10,000 persons. Therefore, decentralized city governments in a way that gives local control to communities of 5,000 5, to 10,000 persons as nearly as possible, use natural, geographic, and historical boundaries to mark these communities. Give each community the power to initiate, decide, and execute the affairs that concern it closely. Land use, housing, maintenance, streets, parks, police, schooling, welfare, neighborhood services. This one I also like a lot. Um, and in the context of a DAO, and specifically, uh, riffing off David's comments about ownership, which I think is crucial. There is this question of size and, which, and how large DAOs should be or how large they can be. And I think what's the takeaway from this and a few of the other previous patterns is you start to get a sense of how large communities can be or how, how large they have been in nature up until this point. Uh, before people begin to feel uh, alienated from their, their, their uh, representatives. Um, so they propose basically that if, if, you have a, if you have a community of five to 10,000, that is enough that they are essentially self-sufficient. Uh, whether or not that exact, you know, that same number translates online is to, is to be decided, but, I, but the real reason of sharing these is that I want these to hopefully inspire us to ask if there are analogs in this world that we're creating, can we use this research and patterns like this to begin to experiment and test some of these theories? Things like when do, at what size do we, do we see more creation happening in a certain DAO? Uh, how many individuals can actually own uh, uh, something before they feel like they're just there. It's just a it, it's just a uh, a trinket rather than a valued item in their possession. Um, this last one I'll end with is the network of learning. Number eighteen, uh, and I thought this one was impactful and and one I have not yet seen. Uh, it's basically talking about. Um, well, let me read the problem statement. <clears throat> In a society which emphasizes teaching, children and students and adults become passive and un unable to think for them and act for themselves. Creative, active individuals can only grow up in a society which emphasizes learning instead of em emphasizing teaching. Solution, therefore, instead of the lockstep of compulsory schooling in a fixed place, work in a piecemeal way to decentralize the process of learning and enrich it through contact with many places and people all over the city. Workshop teachers at home or walking through the city professionals willing to take on young children as helpers, older children teaching younger children, museums, youth group traveling, scholarly seminars. Conceive of all of these situations as forming the backbone of the learning process for, the, for those in the city. Survey all of the situations, describe them, and then publish them as the city's curriculum. Let students, children, and families and neighborhoods decide for themselves and weave together for themselves the situations that comprise their school, paying as they go with standard vouchers raised by community tax, build new educational facilities in ways which extend and enrich this network. Uh, I'm going to end there, but uh, I, when I read that statement, again, this was an audiobook, so I was driving uh, from Salt Lake City, I couldn't help but think that there... Um, that this idea of creating online communities, like we've seen, I'm sure we've all taken and joined, if, if you're a builder for sure, taken some of these um, kind of online, either boot camps or online courses where you've, uh, where you've met with others. But this idea of learning from those who you live with 
is something profound. I've always felt that you know, sitting in a lecture and having to then take a test and just you know, make sure that you've, you've, you've nailed all that knowledge did very little to actually enrich the soul. It, did very, you know, it, it only really satisfied a few um, requirements that, that really did very little for society. Whereas if we build the society of learning from the ground up, which is something a DAO can facilitate, then we will uh, not only become better citizens ourselves, but we'll be helping each other out in the process. Uh, my name is Matt Wood. Um, again, I'm from Ample. I would love to talk with anybody with regards to uh, video streaming and our hopes to, to solve licensing. Um, thank you very much, A Pattern Language. Thanks, man.